Good morning, church. We, we took some time to greet each other, and I'd like to say that's because I just felt very loving and warm and hospitable this morning, but the truth of the matter is we were still missing one of the microphones we needed. So now we've got it. We got it straight. Luke 21. Now, I'm going to go ahead and read a part of this, beginning in verse 25, and then I'm going to explain some of that, and we're going to go on with the message. Luke 21, beginning in verse 25, there will be signs in the sun, moon, and stars. On the earth, nations will be in anguish and perplexity at the roaring and tossing of the sea. Men will faint from terror, apprehensive of what is coming on the world. For the heavenly bodies will be shaken. At that time they will see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. When these things begin to take place, stand up and lift up your heads because your redemption is drawing near. He told them this parable. Look at the fig tree and all the trees when they sprout leaves. You can see for yourselves and know that summer is near. Even so, when you see these things happening, you know that the kingdom of God is near. I'll tell you the truth, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Be careful, or your hearts will be weighed down by dissipation and drunkenness and the anxieties of life and That day will close on you unexpectedly like a trap. For it will come upon all those who live on the face of the whole earth. Be always on the watch and pray that you may be able to escape all that is about to happen and that you may be able to stand before the Son of Man. I'm doing something a little different this December. Uh, This is the first Sunday of December. It is what the churches across the land that follow the the lectionary or the liturgical calendar would call the first Sunday of Advent. Now, historically speaking, and I have never followed the lectionary, and historically speaking, the Churches of Christ have never followed the liturgy of what many, not all, but many of the religious world or or Christian churches are doing today. But this, this is the passage that many churches today are looking at. And I thought it would be interesting, not binding myself to this, but I thought it'd be interesting, at least least for the next few weeks as we head toward Christmas, that that I follow the track of the scriptures that are in the lectionary just to see uh, what the world, what many in the world right now, what many today in church is hearing. In other words, there's a good chance that most of your religious friends, or many anyway, that are sitting in church right now are hearing from the same text or one of the other of the four texts. Psalm 25 that was read just a moment ago uh, that Lee read, that was one of the lectionary readings for this week. Uh, There's a couple others that I'm going to incorporate into the message this morning. But it's interesting, when you look at the first Sunday of Advent, and Advent is the word that means coming, the Lord's coming. And the, the, the liturgical calendar starts in December, and it's approaching Christmas. Obviously, the coming of the Lord when He was made incarnate and lived in this world. It's like what John's Gospel said, In John chapter 1, verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then you go down to verse 14, it says the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The incarnation of the putting on a flesh, in other words, of God in a body, Jesus, who is the exact representation of God and the radiance of His glory, according to Hebrews 1, verse 3. The Christmas story as the world sees it when Jesus was born and in the stable because there was no room in the inn and we're heading toward that.
time in our calendars. I find it interesting, though, when I first thought, well, let's see what the rest of the, what many in the religious world are following as we head to Christmas, that we start with a passage like this, which has nothing to do with the first coming, but is about the second coming. And I find it kind of interesting to kick off the holiday season, if you will, that such a passage like this would be chosen because when you get right down to it and you begin at the context back as early as verse 5 and you read the totality of that chapter, it is going to be one of the most terroristic passages you'll ever read. They're, they're walking around in Jerusalem. Jesus and, and many others are with him and, and they're talking to Jesus about, look at this temple. Now, at the end of the passage... We can see this note that every day Jesus was going to the temple and in the mornings people would come to the temple to hear him teach and the evening he'd go out to the hill called the Mount of Olives. And he was doing that every day. Now this is just, these are just hours away before he's going to be turned over to be killed. But people are coming to him at the temple and this particular day they're at the temple area and people are commenting to him about the building. It says in verse 5, they're talking about how beautifully adorned it was and all the gifts that had been dedicated to God. Look at the stones and look at the artwork or the gold that's been brought. Look at all the precious gifts that have been delivered here at the temple. Talking about its grandeur, its magnificence, its, its splendor. As if we've got the greatest temple in the world. And Jesus makes a remarkable statement to them to kind of stop them in their tracks. And to paraphrase, I would put it like this in my imagination, if it were in today's vernacular, if I was playing the role of Jesus. Oh, you're talking about this building? About this wonderful pulpit here that no one has ever figured out why uh, it's put over here to the side. Uh, I never have preached from it because I feel like if I get in it, I'd never get out. It's kind of an entrapping thing. About the wonderful brickwork. The stonework, folks, this is cinder block, just to let you know. The wonderful lighting, I love the lights. Some people have commented about the light. I love, we don't have stained glass, but we've got stained gems on our lights. Have you ever looked at that? Some of you are saying, yeah, when your sermons get boring, we count them. <laughs> what, a, what a wonderful, we don't have stained glass, but we do have a tinted glass, purple. And then we covered it up with something else. I'm not sure what that is. Wonderful, wonderful building. I love the building that we're in. I'm, I'm grateful for the building. Are you glad we have heater and air conditioner in the summer? Are you glad that we have a great facility? Amen. I'm so glad we got better carpet than what we had when I first came here. And there's lots of improvements. The foyer is awesome. The foyer has been updated and stuff. And I would think that maybe Jesus at this point would say, yeah, you're talking about this building? Let me tell you something about this building. This building has no significant value when it comes to the end of the world. Not one stone is going to be left upon another stone. Everything is going to be torn down to the ground and burned. And if you were the one that was commenting to Jesus about, look at how, one, isn't it great? We've got a great temple, God. Not, not that I'm comparing that this building is like the temple in any way. By the way, doesn't the Bible say that God does not dwell in a temple made by hands? but he dwells in our hearts, isn't that right? That your bodies is the temple of God's Holy Spirit today. See, the whole idea has changed, hasn't it? And that we're to not offer sacrifices at a geographical place, but that we ourselves are to offer our living bodies as sacrifices to God. That's Romans 12, verse 1. But Jesus stops them in their tracks and says, this building that you have so much pride in has nothing to do and will have no significant value at all in saving your souls. As a matter of fact, let me tell you something that's going to happen. And he begins to describe to them about things that look like catastrophes of natural causes, earthquakes, maybe volcano activity, all kinds of things happening with the sun, moon, and stars, and, and everything just seems to be like it's, it's falling to pieces. And he is using apocalyptic language here to describe an event that they're going to see. As a matter of fact, he says this will happen in this generation's time, speaking of the people he's writing to at that moment in time. And what I believe he's referring to for the majority of what we've read this morning has to do with an event that happened in 70 A.D., 
which was 40 years away or almost 40 years away from the time Jesus is talking about it. And that was the fall of Jerusalem. And the destruction of the temple occurs in 70 AD. That's a historical fact that the temple gets demolished and not one stone was left atop another stone. This sounds like a great text to introduce the holiday season, doesn't it? City streets, busy sidewalks, holiday cheers everywhere in this text, isn't it? I just wonder why, why this passage? Why start the holiday season about this passage? Like I said, it's, it's terroristic. It looks like gloom and doom and destruction. And here's the point that I think I can make from this. Sometimes you watch a good movie, but before you get the background story, they show you toward the end, and then it flashes back and builds up to that current scene. They'll start with the end scene, but then you wonder, how did you get to that point? And I'm thinking, maybe that's what the liturgical church is trying to do right now. Before we can talk about the first coming of Jesus, let's get the second one right first. Because in the real state of urgency existing here, we've got to make sure that His coming is right. So what if you know every detail about the birth of Jesus? Maybe you've learned, you know, the Bible doesn't say there were three wise men. It never said three. It said three gifts. Maybe you, you thought the wise man, the magi, came while Jesus was in the stable or the cave or wherever the, because there was no room in the, actually the wise men didn't visit there. They visited at the house probably when Jesus was two years old. You can check that out if you want to fact check that. Maybe you, maybe you figured out some of the details that you grew up with maybe are not so kosher to the Scripture. But I am more interested in maybe, do you have the ending right? Are you ready for God's ushering in Jesus' second return to this earth? You see, there's a sense in which Jesus was coming during the 70 AD, the judgment upon Israel, the judgment upon the, the destruction of the temple, the fall of Jerusalem. But then he, he goes into the second coming. That has not happened yet. Another interesting note that you'll probably need to be made aware of. This gospel that Luke pens gets the date. It's written in 70 AD. And I found out this week that all gospels, with the exception of maybe Mark, were written after the fall of Jerusalem had taken place. Mark may be as early as 66 AD. But Luke is writing this when it's happened, or has already happened. <clears throat> so why would Luke want to record <coughs> excuse me, something of this nature here at the beginning of what the liturgical church calls the first Sunday of Advent? Why would we start with that? Well, if you look at the text in Luke 21... You will notice from like verses 5 through 36, you're going to find about a dozen action phrases or verbs. You'll see, watch out, verse 8, don't be deceived, verse 8, don't be frightened, verse 9, prepare for persecution, verse 12, don't worry about what to say, verse 15, stand firm, verse 19, lift up your heads, verse 28. Don't let dissipation weigh you down. Don't get drunk. Don't let anxiety take control. Verse 34 and verse 36. Watch and pray. And I can at least derive one point from those action phrases. Pay attention. He gives a parable of the fig tree. How you can look at the fig tree and know what season is coming or what season has just passed. Pay attention. You see... It's one thing to know about the beginning of the story of the coming of the Lord. It's an, it, it, at the beginning time. It's another thing to know what happens at the end time when he comes again. And are you ready? And I think what we're needing to see is not just the beginning of time or the end time, but what we're doing in the meantime, the here and now. And that is we need to pay attention. Several times he says, you're going to be able to watch, you're going to be able to observe, you're going to be able to see there are signs. And yet, we know we can't go as far as to say, hey, I know when the Lord's second coming is going to take place. Because Jesus himself has said, not even does the Son of Man know that. And time after time again, people have tried to predict the end of the world, haven't they? And nobody's got it right yet. 
And Jesus is right when he says, only God the Father knows. Even before he ascends back to heaven, after spending three and a half years with his disciples, trying to transcend their thinking from this physical idea of what his kingdom would be like to a spiritual idea of what the kingdom really will be like, they still ask him the question, this is in Acts 1, Lord, will you at this time restore Israel to its sovereignty? And Jesus says to them, this is Acts chapter 1, it's not for you to know the times and the seasons, to know exact dates. The Lord's coming can happen tonight. It can happen next week. It can happen a year from now. It can happen another thousand years from now. The idea, though, is that it doesn't change what you and I are called to do. Pay attention. I think a second point can be made, inferring this, and that is we need to live right. Live right. We don't live in a state of fear because of all the, maybe the terroristic language or the things that we look in this text and say, that, that just scares me to death. To, to think about the fact that when Jesus comes, there's going to be destruction. There will be the fire and elements of this world will be consumed by fire, according to Peter, what he wrote. And yet, there's a positive hope that's given in the text for those of us who belong to God, we should not have to worry. Amen? Blessed are those who God is the Lord. And the Bible says here in the last part of this text, or toward the end, verse 28, when these things begin to take place, stand up and lift your head. Because your redemption is drawing near. In other words, you don't look at this with fear and dread. You look at this with hope and anticipation. There's many places in the Bible where when referring to the second coming of Jesus, we ought to anticipate it and look forward to it. And rejoice all the more as we see that day approaching. But that depends on what side of the fence you're on, doesn't it? The Bible says, this is Romans chapter 11, verse 22, Behold both the goodness and the sternness of God. Goodness for those who obviously got it right with God in a relationship. Sternness and severity for those who don't. Pay attention, but have hope. Lift up your head. Look for the coming of Jesus at the very tail end of Revelation. There is this anticipation passage that when it talks about the coming and it talks about what heaven's going to be like, there's no tears there, there's no night there, there's no junk there. We'll just sum it all up. All the junk of the world you've ever experienced, no worries in life there, no pain, no disease, no sickness, no illness, no death, no crying. Aren't you ready for a place like that? And when John gets to the very end, he says, nay, that comes soon. The bride and spirit say, come, and yes, come, come, let this happen now. And we should anticipate the Lord's second coming like that. And I think once we appreciate that and that we've got the paying attention right and that we're living right and we're lifting up our heads and we're hoping right, it'll make the first coming more meaningful to us. You know, in the... The story, A Christmas Carol, Charles Dickens, is that right? You remember Ebenezer Scrooge gets a visit from three different ghosts. You remember that? Yep, You're, you girls have seen this, right? <laughs> ghosts of Christmas past, ghosts of Christmas present, and ghosts of Christmas future, right? And maybe that's the idea, because Scrooge does not really make a life change until he has gotten to that ghost of Christmas future and he sees what all is going to take place due to the, all the decisions he's made of the past and currently is making in the present and where it's leading and he doesn't like where it's leading him to. And the idea is that you and I stop, that we pause and that we think, where is our life's path leading us to? Where's it taking us? Am I on a path right now that's going to be in a good light in light of the passage we just read when Jesus comes a second time? Or am I going down a path right now that's kind of dark and scary and that could be kind of really intimidating to think if the Lord were to come right now, He'd catch me on this path. And maybe it's time we change courses. And Scrooge does, doesn't he? He becomes a lot more open to love and compassion and caring and serving and generous 
than he ever was before because of the future picture he saw of himself. Folks, we've got to have an imagination here to get our souls right. We've got to look at what is in store for our future. You need to picture yourself where you're at when Jesus comes again. And we don't know how much time we've got. We don't know how long it will be before Jesus says, go get your bride, and that Jesus comes a second time. Pay attention. Live right. Live with hope. Have the future in view. You see, the other text that is in the Old Testament is Jeremiah. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will fulfill the gracious promise I made to the house of Israel and to the house of Judah in those days. And at that time, I will make a righteous branch sprout from David's line. This is Messianic, speaking of Jesus. He will do what is just and right in the land. In those days, Judah will be saved and Jerusalem will live in safety. This is the name by which it will be called the Lord, our righteousness. Speaking of the coming of the Lord. And then Paul wrote in the other passage that we've been assigned is 1 Thessalonians 3. Now may he, may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus clear the way for us to come to you. This is Paul and Silas writing to the church at Thessalonica. But then he says, may the Lord make your love increase and overflow for each other and for everyone else, just as ours does for you. May he strengthen your hearts so that you will be blameless and holy in the presence of our God and Father when our Lord Jesus comes with all his holy ones. So before we get any further into talking about the arrival of Jesus the first time and the birth of Jesus and all that goes with that, let's give great thought today about his second coming. Because one's in the past, but one's in the future. How should that affect your present? Do you need to change course? Stop what you're doing, repent and get right? Do you need to become a Christian? If there's anybody here this morning that is a Christian, but you're struggling with where you're living at right now, spiritually speaking, you need to get on the right path. You need to be restored. Whatever the need is today, I'm, I'm begging you, I'm asking you to consider, where will you be when Jesus comes? Do you know that when the Lord comes that you would be saved without a doubt? You've got to answer that question. If we can help you answer it today, we'd love to do so as we stand and sing.